Starship is back on the stand preparing for its next flight. Dragon makes room in the nest for the arrival of its sister ship. SpaceX places more Starlink satellites in orbit, but says goodbye to one of their vessels. And today we have a double header honorable mention. I'm Kevin and this is SpaceX in the News. So we finally have answers as to what exactly happened during SN11's landing. Prior to liftoff less than two weeks ago, SN11's personal space was violated by some creeper who trespassed onto SpaceX's property in Starbase, Texas, filming the felonious encounter for his blog. Though Starship didn't leave a note, it's assumed this brief encounter was more than enough to make the rocket want to kill itself. After all, I got the same urge a second ago just by saying the word vlog. Guy. In his defense, the vlogger did make an apology video, but I didn't watch it because I hate feeling embarrassed for other people. And YouTube tends to be the best place for that. I know, I live an ironic life. Probably why I was conceived on a pullout couch and will end up dying in the living room. All kidding aside, and although the vlogger's actions weren't really the reason SN11 exploded, they were enough to annoy everyone who appreciates the transparency SpaceX has gifted us these past few years and worry that he may have screwed us. Don't believe me? I'm sure you can just read the comments below this video. In reality, Elon said it was Raptor engine dose that caused SN11's rud. Up until the landing, everything was good, save for a relatively small methane leak that fried part of the avionics, causing a hard start during the landing burn in the methane turbo pump. This is getting fixed six ways to Sunday, so that means his engineers still have two days before everyone's fired. Oh, you're fired. In the boss's opinion, the ideal scenario is one where Starship is caught in a horizontal glide with no landing burn at all. Although that would be quite a challenge for the tower, which has been given the additional responsibility of catching the rockets. During emergencies, Starship would just land on its skirt. Well, at least I know what that would look like thanks to SN10. However, legs will still be needed to land on the surface of the Moon and Mars. Since there's less gravity on both, the weight problem won't be as much of an issue, but they'll still have to be able to deal with uneven terrain. The Super Heavy Booster, largest flying object ever designed, in case you weren't aware, will be snatched out of the sky by the tower. Big step forward as reflight can be done in under an hour. They'll achieve it using load points just below the grid fins and shock absorption built into the tower arms. Since the tower is ground side, it can use a lot more mass to arrest the booster's downward momentum. A study by the FAA has been conducted for SpaceX's said tower and concluded that the structure does not exceed obstruction standards and would not be a hazard to air navigation. In the study, the tower is listed to be 479 feet tall. In other Starship news, SN15 received its nose cone earlier in the week, and the stand on which it will be tested received the hydraulic rams for battering the thrust puck, something that will need to be performed given the vehicle has hundreds of design improvements. 15 was delivered to that stand yesterday afternoon, where it is now beginning a series of stress tests. And the Ground Systems Equipment 1 tank was also moved from the construction yard to the orbital launch site this week. This big fella made out of Starship parts will hold some of the cryogenics used to propel Starship Super Heavy. And a Raptor vacuum engine was spotted on the test stand in McGregor, Texas by Gary Blair for NASA's spaceflight. You can see it sitting there next to a sea level Raptor, a new and improved version. Moving on to Dragon News Meow. In the early hours of Monday morning, Crew 1 changed the parking spot for their Dragon capsule, the first time such a thing has ever been done. Relocating it to an adjacent port so the Crew 2 capsule, launching on the 22nd of this month, can have the vacated spot. That way, when Crew-1 departs for Earth at the end of the month, the port it occupies at the moment can be used by a Cargo Dragon capsule launching in June. Apparently, it's the best place to offload new solar array panels for the station the Cargo capsule will be carrying. Dragon SpaceX soft capture confirmed. Crew-1's Japanese member, Soichi, did an unbagging video of the SpaceX spacesuit on his own YouTube channel, going over all the interesting deeds it has to offer, but good luck learning about them, the English subtitles are Mad Libs. One of SpaceX's giant boom sticks lifted off on Wednesday, carrying another flock of Starlink sats for their internet constellation, now with a tally of well over 1,300. This was the booster that put Bob and Doug in space, being its seventh flight overall. And it will have the opportunity to fly for an eighth time because it made a graceful landing on the drone ship out in the Atlantic. Stage one landing leg deploy. Beautiful. SpaceX President Gwen Shotwell participated in this year's Satellite 2021 LEO Digital Forum and announced the company has no plans to tier price Starlink services to its customers, which means spoiled brats with rich parents won't be able to pay for faster speeds and own you as easily in PVP sessions. Surprise, motherfucker! 
Shotwell also informed us that SpaceX has been eating a majority of the costs required to make the Starlink user terminal on behalf of their customers. Originally priced at three grand a piece, SpaceX was selling the UFOs on a stick to consumers at 500, but have since managed to cut the price down by more than 50% to about 1300. And SpaceX's former fairing catching ship, Miss Tree, also known as Mystery, or formerly Mr. Steven before this exchange, has signed off and pulled out of port for the last time. SpaceX has ended their attempts at catching fairings from space and is instead opting to just fish them out of the water after splashdown under parachute. Greg Scott was at the scene to capture he, her's departure. But, but if that makes you sad, call your sad. Don't be, because that's dumb. It's a boat. And listen, stop personifying inanimate objects on social media too, all right? That's what's really sad here. If you're going to identify as something you're not, at least make it an Apache helicopter. That way, instead of pissing all over yourself on the way out, you can equalize the haters and glass the aners. <laughs> anyway, Miss Chief will be following suit soon, but both have at least been temporarily replaced with a new ship, shown here. Greg saw her returning to port with one of the fairings from this recent Starlink launch. And Elon still plans to add another drone ship to the fleet soon, a shortfall of Gravitas. Crazy number of launches this year, including some Falcon Heavies. Now it's time for today's honorable mentions. <laughs> NASA is preparing to fly the first Martian helicopter. Earlier this week, Ingenuity unfolded and deployed from the bottom of its mothership, Perseverance, who had no qualms leaving the little hitchhiking mooch behind. It's been holding up well ever since, surviving the cold Martian nights with its onboard heaters and insulation. The agency is targeting no earlier than this Sunday for the drone's first attempt at a powered controlled flight. Our second honorable mention is Copenhagen Suborbitals, a team of volunteers living in Denmark aiming to place a man in space on their homemade Spica rocket. They recently performed a series of static fires for their rocket engine, the 100 kil Newton BPM-100, to test four different types of coaxial swirler injector types. What they're up to is pretty rad bra. So I kept in touch after featuring them in my parachute documentary last year. And when I asked for a comment on how the day went, this is what they had to say. Quote, the test marks the first time Copenhagen uses 3D metal print technology as one of the injectors included in swirler elements printed in stainless steel. As far as we can tell from the preliminary analysis, we see a performance increase compared to our standard shower head injector. However, we also see a tendency for the engine to be more prone to oscillations, strong enough to rip a bigger engine apart, thus the operating window seems more narrow. And it is essential that we understand this behavior before we start manufacturing the first BPM-100 injector." End quote. This common problem becomes more prevalent in the rocket industry as you see an increase in specific impulse. The Saturn V's F1 engines had issues with rotating flames at high speeds, but were fixed with a particular arrangement of baffles on their injectors. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for stopping by and tuning in. Shout out to my members on Patreon and YouTube for their support of the show. Links in the description if you too would like more SpaceX news in your week. Do have a nominal weekend, and until next time, Godspeed.